the, this myth of Spartan greatness is all about the idea that they never ran from a fight, they never lost the battle, they never surrendered. Right. You know, it's all nonsense. And let's make a scorecard and narrate that scorecard. And that became the core idea behind the book. And when I pitched it to Osprey, they were like, that's awesome, go write it. An excerpt from today's guest has written a book dispelling many of the myths of the Spartan warrior. Mike Cole is here, and I speak with him after this break. This is Point of the Spear. Welcome back. I'm Robert Child. Today's guest has worked as a security contractor and military officer. His career has run the gamut from counterterrorism to cyber warfare to federal law enforcement. He's done three tours in Iraq and was recalled to serve during the Deepwater Horizon oil spill. His latest military history book is called The Bronze Lie, Shattering the Myth of Spartan Warrior Supremacy. And author Mike Cole joins us now. Mike, welcome to the show. Thanks so much for having me. It's a, it's a pleasure and an honor. I was reading one of, the, one of the reviews, and I just wanted to reference that. And uh, it said, as entertaining as it is enlightening, Mike Cole's The Bronze Lie reveals the fascinating reality behind one of the most pervasive myths of the ages. This is Sparta, Professor Michael Livingston, Citadel. And, yeah, and uh, full disclosure, uh, Mike is both a mentor and a dear friend. Um, he, uh, he, his most recent book, Never Greater Slaughter, Brennan Burr and the Birth of England, is sort of a, a model to me of how to write great narrative military history. Um, you know, when I, when I first started out trying to make the transition from science fiction and fantasy into uh, writing real scholarly history, I both wanted to write narrative stuff that was gripping but I wanted to make sure it was built on a foundation of unimpeachable scholarship. And uh, I, Mike was somebody I actually sought out because he had that career. He had written the Shards of Heaven series with Tor books. Uh, it was a great mm-hmm. fantasy trilogy, but is also a professor of medieval warfare at the Citadel. Um, and I was just incredibly lucky that he was willing to, to take a complete stranger under his wing. And he, to this day, uh, he, he mentors me and I go to him with all of my questions on historiography and how to approach sources. We are actually due to go to Greece together uh, on August 21st to do research um, for an upcoming joint project. Unfortunately, uh, we may have to cancel both because Greece is having an incredible outbreak of COVID, you know, some of the worst in the world, and also because the entire country is on fire right now. Like it's, you know, it's really uh, it's really being hit really hard, which kills me because I'm actually a firefighter. Uh, unfortunately, I'm a structural firefighter and what they're facing is wildfires and that's a completely different skill. Um, and uh, so there's really you know, nothing I could do even if uh, they were looking for you know, USAID, which I, I don't, they don't seem to be. But yeah, sorry, I just want to give you the background on Mike. No, that's great because uh, mentors are very important in writing. Oh yeah, absolutely critical, sure. I haven't read much of uh, ancient military history. Mm -hmm. So I have to say that up front. So I wasn't familiar with the term the Spartan Mirage. Oh, yeah. I I thought that was a really interesting term because I saw it all over the place. And I assume that, you know, before the movie, the 300, that that Mirage existed. Could you speak about that? Yeah, sure. Well, first, I want to credit the historian who came up with it, uh, a French historian by the name of Francois Ollier. And it's it's originally in French, the Mirage Spartiette, um, but what he means is this idea that the, the Spartans, you know, they left us no writing other than a, a few pieces of epigraphy that are, you know, uh, tombstones and things like that, but no actual literary writing about themselves. Everything we know about them comes from the perspective of outsiders. And from what we know of the Spartans, it's they had a real desire to be mysterious to people outside their own communities. Mm-hmm. So that mirage, this, uh, you know, the idea of, of almost like think of it like a fog of war, you have to penetrate these myths about um, people who are outside your community to, to understand your community uh, is really what, what Francois Ollier was getting at. Um, and you're right, uh, it did exist. It existed all throughout history. In fact, I, I wrote a, a piece in the New Republic a couple of years back, um, which got a pretty good attention, which documents the history of this Sparta worship, what we call Laconophilia. The Spartans hailed from a region in Greece that we know as Laconia, um, and they referred to themselves as Lacedaemonians. Uh, the, the idea of calling them Spartans is a, you know, more of, a, a, of our appellation. Right. Um, but uh, 
is recently, I mean, it's all the way back from the end of the Battle of Thermopylae, which is the battle described in the film 300, um, we can see that mirage beginning. This, this idea of the battle itself being this selfless suicide mission, this incredible sacrifice that these men made, when of course, it's just absolutely not true at all. And uh, uh, Tom Holland, who's a really wonderful and brilliant historian, uh, I highly recommend that your listeners um, read his book, Persian Fire, if they have a chance. It's probably the best uh, modern history of the Greco-Persian War that I've ever read. Mm. Um, but he theorized in a separate article that Themistocles, who was the head of the Hellenic League, this is the Greek League that was set up to defend against the Persians. When Thermopylae happened, this is the battle that the film 300 was made about, it was such a loss, such a disaster, that Themistocles was worried the Greeks would just surrender to the Persians and the war would be over. And right. so he began to spin this myth of the Spartans' selfless noble sacrifice, how this wasn't really a defeat, it was a moral victory. And then the, the hits just kept coming from there, all the way up until 2021, where we have U.S. senators and, you know, the Oath Keepers and all kinds of um, modern political figures still using this myth uh, as an important part of their, you know, galvanizing principles. Yeah, it did seem to uh, rear its, I don't want to say ugly head, but it did rear its head <laughs> yeah, it's really and I'm glad, by the way, uh, that you don't say ugly head. You know, one of the things I've been trying to do, um, uh, you know, in the, you know, post Trump having left office is, you know, be less angry and dismissive of, of other people's political arguments. I definitely want to want to live in a country where, you know, we move forward together. So I'm glad that you you made that point. Um, it's a, it's a it's a good attitude to have. Yeah, you you know, it's time to put the divisiveness aside. If we're ever... I agree. I totally agree. And look, this is the thing. Laconophilia, the myth of of how great Sparta was, like that's nothing to be ashamed of. You know, if you're if you're being taught your whole life that this is who the Spartans were and this is what they meant. I mean, people get tattoos of this stuff. Right. I don't want to be the guy who points and laughs at them. I don't want to be the person who berates them for having believed that, um, you know, that has meaning to people, but I do want to be the guy who, who brings the truth out, right. Who, who confronts people with, with the truth of who the Spartans were, but I certainly don't want to do it in a way that antagonizes anybody. Yeah. You're sort of pulling back the curtain. That's right. And letting, letting people make their own decisions. That's a great way to put it. You did an earlier book, uh, Legion versus Phalanx. And yeah. the epic struggle, struggle uh, for infantry supremacy in the ancient world. Did that book lead to this book, or was are they connected? Um, yeah, they absolutely are connected. So, um, Legion versus Phalanx was my first foray into history, and the long. The, I'll try to keep it as brief as possible. But the story behind that was I was war gaming battles between the Roman Legion and the Greek Phalanx, um, and. Uh, I wanted to read more about it because it's these two totally different military formations. It's sort of like Batman versus Superman, X-Wing versus TIE fighter, that kind of a thing. Right. And I was, I was poking around trying to find books about it. And I discovered that there were, I mean, there were certainly discussions about it, but no one had written a book just about these two formations fighting each other. And I thought, man, this is a great idea. And I went to my agent and I, you know, I put together a proposal and said, why don't I write it? And, I, and my agent said, well, you're a science fiction fantasy writer. You don't have a Ph.D. in this topic. You know, um, you, you know, you won't be able to do this. Uh, and I, I mean, go ahead, man. Tell me what I can't do. <laughs> um, and, and don't worry, he's not my agent anymore. Um, so I wrote it. I taught myself the Latin and Greek necessary to do my own translations. I went over to Greece. Um, again, this is where Mike Livingston, who I mentioned before, really mentored me, held my hand through how to do battlefield surveys, even convinced me to do them in the first place. He taught me his central axiom of warfare history, which is that a battle is its ground. If you're going to talk about a battle, you better go stand on the battlefield. Yes. Um, and uh, I put that book together and that sort of taught me, hey, you know, this is a thing I can do. I can do not only military history, but, but ancient military history. Um, and I had all of those tools now in my toolbox. So when that book was a success, I, I got to go out to dinner um, with my uh, uh, commissioning editor from Osprey. And he asked me, what did I want to do next? And um, that idea for the bronze lie had been kicking around in my head for quite some time, largely because I'd seen with the, with the rise of Trump, you know, the real far political right. Um, you know, uh, we're talking, uh, you know, the Oath Keepers, uh, Generation Identitaire in France, 
Um, we're talking, you know, the sons of Odin, like very, very golden dawn in Greece, really far, far right groups were using Spartan imagery. Um, and I read an amazing article by a professor at the University of Iowa named Sarah Bond in a, a now defunct journal called Eidolon, unfortunately it's defunct, where she talked about the myth of Spartan greatness and badassery generally. And I thought, wow, what if I hit it from a military perspective strictly? Because if the, the, this myth of Spartan greatness is all about the idea that they never ran from a fight, they never lost a battle, they never surrendered, right. you know, it's all nonsense. So I thought, well, look, look, why don't we just keep score? Let's go through the sources. Let's go through Xenophon and Thucydides and Polybius and Plutarch and Herodotus and all of them. And let's look at every single battle they fought. We know them. But, you know, we have documentation for all of them. Did they win? Did they lose? Did they surrender? Um, and let's make a scorecard and narrate that scorecard. And that became the core idea behind the book. And when I pitched it to Osprey, they were like, that's awesome, go write it. Thanks for listening to the program. I hope you'll support our guests by clicking on the book purchase link in this episode's description. Each purchase helps support local bookstores, and that's always a good thing. It's rare that if I go to a public event that somebody doesn't come in and uh, comment uh, on either Gettysburg or Gods and Generals. Director Ron Maxwell on history storytellers. You know, you, you never know how a film's gonna be received when you make it, and you never know how it's gonna be received uh, w- with the passage of time. I think certainly in the case of, the, of Gettysburg, we started with an extraordinary novel, uh, Michael Shara's The Killer Angels. Great storytelling, great characters. And uh, then we had a great cast, uh, just a wonderful collection of actors, wonderful crew. And it was a magical time. I mean, we worked our butts off the summer of uh, 1992 at uh, Gettysburg when we filmed that. Uh, Long hours. We had way too many setups that we could possibly have done per day. But we did it. We got the job done. And uh, we remain to this day a band of brothers and sisters, those of us who worked on that movie. Watch season one of History Storytellers on Amazon Prime Video. To live in the ancient Mediterranean was to be in a warrior culture. We do not have evidence that Sparta was more warrior than other uh, uh, city states. Um, they, you know, this idea that um, Spartans only devoted themselves to wars, it's just nonsense. There was a noble class and they, we know that they devoted themselves to sports and managing their estates and politics and they had slaves to do their work. We certainly have evidence that the Spartan army may have been more disciplined and organized. Notice that I use disciplined and organized and not professional. I do not use that word professional because they were not professional in the modern sense. But there's a wonderful quote from Aristotle who says that the Spartans were such great warriors, not because they trained harder than the other Greeks, but because they trained at all. Uh, Um, The point is, is that they were great in comparison due to the very amateur nature of Greek military endeavors in that period. Um, But this idea that they were a warrior society in and above the incredibly warlike world in which they existed is it's just not supported by the evidence and they just trained and, yeah uh, well so so just to just to uh give you an example of what i'm talking about hoplite uh, hoplite is the way to say it in greek i'm going to anglicize it hoplite warfare this is how the heavy infantry of of greece fought it was these were not standing armies right these were think of them like reservists you know you right. farmed your fields you 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 know you, you made your leather work or whatever it was you were doing and then the, the balloon went up and, you know, you grabbed your spear out of your shed and you grabbed your shield that you're, you're using as a bird bath and you showed up in formation. And the way you fought was straight ahead, shoving, you know, with your shields overlapping. It was deliberately designed to be simple because you couldn't really practice. Right. Um, so that was the standard. Right. The standard is you have a full time job as a usually as a farmer, but there are other jobs, too. Right. Um, and then, you know, you, you went to go fight when your city state asked you to. Um, because the Spartans, at least, and not all the Spartans, but the Spartiati, the, the, the noble, the peers, the, you know, the, think of it as like, it was almost, you know, think of it as it's a slave society. You have a tiny, tiny minority at the very, very top of the pyramid and all of the labor is done by slaves right. and they have the free time, you know, to do whatever they want. Um, and we have evidence that they train for sports, but we don't have evidence of them drilling with weapons and in formation. We do not have sources saying that they do that. We do have sources saying that they had a greater degree of organization and discipline than other Greek city-states. So I just wanted to paint the picture for you there. No, absolutely. I've read a little about the culture, and you obviously have studied it 
What struck me was that women in the society seem to have more or equal power with men. Well, Did you find that? I wouldn't, I wouldn't say equal power, right? So Greek, Greece, you know, you got to think of Greece almost like modern Saudi Arabia, like or probably worse. But, you know, the women's status anywhere in ancient Greece was just, you know, horrific. Um, I will say that Spartan women had greater freedom than some of their um, compatriots. In fact, you know, they could do things like inherit property, which is a huge, huge thing, right. um, uh, you know, over over other women. They could compete in athletics. Um, there is some evidence that they may have been able to train uh, in the nude or with, you know, some parts of their bodies exposed, which was considered shocking uh, by the standards of other uh, Greek communities. You know, Aristotle, uh, who is sort of this epic misogynist, you know, it's very, very, he calls them thigh flashers. He's really scandalized by these Spartan women throwing the discus or wrestling or, you know, whatever it is they're doing. Um, mm-hmm. But I don't want uh, that to be mistook that they had equal power to the men. Uh, it, you know, I don't know that uh, anyone in, in, in Greece had that degree of, um, of equality that we would have liked to have seen. Yeah, yeah. Th- th- another myth. Absolutely. Yes, that's right. Lots of them. Now, you mentioned uh, you've written in other genres, uh, fantasy, and you've done military science fiction, mm-hmm. which I thought was really interesting. You did a book on it. Could you uh, describe that genre? A little yeah, bit? sure. So, um, all, you know, all military science fiction is, uh, I've done, um, I said I have a lost count, I've done 10 other books. Um, uh, th- uh, an- six of them are military fantasy, so figure the modern military with using magic. Um, three of them are straight up medieval fantasy um, on it with a kind of dark tinge. And then one of them is mil- straight up military science fiction. That's called 16th Watch. Um, and that was my most recent novel. And that uh, was so much fun for me. I was an officer in the United States Coast Guard. And one of the things that you get used to when you're in the Coast Guard is nobody thinks you're in the military, even though we are. We've fought in every war the United States has ever gone to. And everyone else who knows you're in the military just relentlessly teases you all the time. And the Coast Guard sort of is constantly getting ignored. Um, and so uh, I know of only one other um, science fiction series that deals with the U.S. Coast Guard. It's called uh, Island in the Sea of Time. It's written by S.M. Sterling. Um, so I thought, yeah, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give the Coast Guard some love. And I, uh, I put them on the moon. And I really was able to use my experience as a Coast Guard officer to project what their mission on the moon would be, um, how they would conduct search and rescue operations and what their role would be. Um, it was a lot of fun to write, and uh, it got a pretty good reception. I was really, uh, it was really, really exciting. It sounds like it. How many years in, is it in the future? Is it uh, the, oh, yeah. So it's in the near future. Um, I, uh, I, uh, it's funny. I'm a big Warhammer 40K fan, so it's funny for me to say this. But I really love extrapolating the very near future because I think that um, when, you, when you get to you know, Star Wars, Star Trek territory, it's so removed from our own experience that it's kind of difficult to get invested it almost feels like fantasy. You know, you have that wonderful Arthur C. Clarke quote, which is that any technology, if it's sophisticated enough, is indistinguishable from magic. You know, I want to avoid that. When you make something near future, it feels immediate in a way. Like this is a thing that might happen to us in our own lifetimes. And I think, at least for me, it improves my investment in the book. And hopefully it does the same for readers. Yeah, it feels more plausible, right? Yeah, yeah. Now you've, uh, besides writing, you've obviously crossed into television. Mm-hmm done a number of appearances on Mm -hmm. uh, Discovery and Mm -hmm. um, one program series on CBS. Mm -hmm. Do you enjoy that work? Oh, God, it's the best. Because I'll tell you this. uh, Well, you work in this field. You know what I'm talking about. Like, look, shooting is hard, right? So when I did Contact, which is the show I did last year, uh, excuse me, 2019 on Discovery, I mean, we would shoot 12, 14 hours. You know, you'd you'd be ready to drop dead. Oh, yeah. But when I write a book, you know, this is a year to two years of work. Um, and writing famously doesn't pay that well. You know, I, I have no complaints. I've had a very successful writing career, um, but it don't pay like TV. Nope. So, you know, for I, I do a TV show and I'm shooting one to two months and I'm making four times the money, 10 times the money. Um, and also, uh, uh, look, I, I make no bones about it. Um, I'm unusual for a writer. I'm an extrovert who loves attention. Um, and I used to be very upset with myself. I used to think that that was a character flaw. Uh, and maybe it is a character flaw, but it's also authentic to who I am. And I just have to accept it. And television is standing around and being made much of, right? It's it's uh, everybody looking at you, which uh, certainly speaks to my soul. Um, 
and also like there's an immediacy and a drama to um you know i, I did unscripted television which isn't really performing but it also is um yeah. and i love that intensity and i also love um it's dependent on the artistry of others in a way that writing, I mean, writing certainly is a team effort. You know, people see your name on the novel or the history book and they don't see the legions of editors and marketers and cover designers. So I don't want to belittle that, but you know, you come onto a set and to you, it feels like one experience. And then you watch the cinematographer and the DP and the store showrunner. And then you see the finished product and the way they, the way you weave into their artwork, it's a, completely sublime experience like it's yeah. fantastic i loved it that's great i yeah i've been in television for three decades and, yeah no i i i, uh, I saw your uh, and and got to the top of the pops brushed the emmy right yeah it's uh i think the word is collaborative um, yeah you know the process because uh i did a, a world war ii film about 10 years ago that i directed and i had 81 people <laughs> on the crew yeah. <laughs> that you know that were uh, that I was sort of responsible for to answer their questions. Yeah, so, yeah. It's very different from writing. <laughs> <laughs> so, what are you working on now that the the book is released? You're so busy all the time. Yeah, I am. But so, but if you'll permit me, I'd like to turn this question back on you. Um, so, you're an Osprey author, and right. when we were emailing, you told told me a little bit um, that your book is about the experience of African American soldiers in World War II. Is that correct? That's correct. Yeah, the that sounds awesome. Movie. Would you be willing to tell me and your listeners a little bit about that? I'd love to hear about it. Sure. It's uh, the book is uh, I just finished up. It's called Mortal Valor. It's coming out in January of twenty twenty two, and it's the stories behind the citations. Essentially, it's the stories. Mm. You, you know, you, you see the Medal of Honor citation, and and it's basically an after action report. I dug into these seven men's lives and found everything I could about uh, their growing up, their environment, and I built a story around their lives. So um, I created um, the seven stories in the book, Mm. Valor, and it's been very, very well received by my editor, and we've just worked on delivering photos for it, and they're very excited about it. So it's... uh, it's sort of a follow-up. I'm interested in World War II African-American history because I did the mm-hmm. Lost Eleven about the the massacre of 11 black soldiers in World War II in Wareth, Belgium. Mm-hmm. So I have a, I don't know what the word would be, an affinity for it, but uh, this seemed to be a natural, after doing that book, uh, a natural next step. Mm-hmm. And, and I've enjoyed it. And, you know... People have no idea, absolutely no idea, what black soldiers went through mm. in World War II. It, mm. It's it, it's astounding when you look into mm. it. What they had, to, you know, the crap they had to put up with. And, yeah, and I think that that's kind of universal for African American history. You know, I'm I'm ashamed of, but not at all surprised to admit that I did not know about Black Wall Street. I did not know about the Tulsa massacre until Watchmen came out on HBO and educated mm-hmm. me. Um, and when I talked to my friends about that, just horrified, how did I miss this thing? You know, everyone was like, yeah, everyone had the same experience. And we missed it because we weren't taught it, you know? So I'm glad that you're, that that's something you're, you're doing work in. It sounds really needed. Yeah, it's, you know, People have asked me, you know, did you jump on the bandwagon, you know, like Black History? And I said, no, this is something that I've, I've been interested in for over a decade. Yeah. Is, you know, yeah. people come around to this history, but I've been interested in it for a while. And uh, it just turns out that it's timely now. Um, it's fantastic. Yeah. When's the, do you know when the book is going to be released? The date they have is uh, listed as January 11th, 2022. Okay, cool. So not too far. I'll send you a copy. <laughs> oh, I'd be very grateful for that. But I, but I, but I'd also uh, prefer to buy a copy so I can support you. That's one of my uh, one of my favorite things to do: support other authors. Well, I I appreciate that very much. Yeah. The book is called his book, Michael, called <laughs> "The Bronze Lie: Shattering the Myth of Spartan Warrior Supremacy." Yeah. Mike, yep. thank you so much for coming on. This has been a real pleasure. Yeah, thank you, man. Really appreciate you taking the time to talk to me. That's it for this episode. Thanks again for joining me. Next time, my guest will be Patrick Bishop, 
author of Operation Jubilee. Yeah, I mean, it was a huge propaganda victory for the Germans. It showed that they could repel with ease a British attack. The fact that there were Americans, Canadians, Brits, it was a kind of multi-allied effort, were all added to uh, propaganda value of the thing. But the Germans put out a, uh, a report, their analysis of what had happened. And the kind of key line was, this was contrary to all military common sense. And I think that's actually got a description of it. That's next time. And if you like what you hear, please share the show on social media and follow me on Twitter, at Rob Child. I'm Robert Child, and this has been Point in the Spear. Music licensed from audioblocks.com. Point of the Spear is produced by RSC Media Group. I wanted to take a moment to thank our growing army of listener supporter members. You make it possible to continue our mission of bringing you the best military history authors, filmmakers, and movers and shakers. If you're not a member yet, it's easy to join, and it takes just seconds. Scroll down to the bottom of this episode's description and click the support link. You'll come to our anchor page, click the support button, complete the brief form. It's that easy. We're planning loyalty perks and giveaways to roll out over the coming months for our early supporters who sign on before the end of the year. So don't wait. Become a member today, and thank you for your support.